Yes, I feel like it's time. Um, and like I said, it makes me nervous because I'm not one to have big opinions or make waves. But uh, I do feel like I have to fight for my friends. I have to fight for, you know, a fair wage. And it's not just about the fair wages. It's also about um, just the education funding for our kids. Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Pod This. We've got a great episode for you this week. I know we missed you guys last week. Sorry that we skipped a week without any notice. Um, I was sick. Andy had a crazy, crazy schedule and it was just not something we could get together to make happen last week. We hope you missed us and we hope you're as excited as we are to be back this week. I have a, I'm have here in Upper Room Studios and I've got a special guest with me in the, uh, the opposite hosting chair today. John, say hello. Hello. I've got Mr. John Rourke here with me today. Friend of the pod. He's friend friend of the pod and is, uh, is guest hosting. He's sitting in for Andy Moore, who could not be with us this week. We'll have Andy back next week. But uh, John, John Joe. That's it. Joe yep. has graciously agreed to sit in and uh, be the voice of reason this week. To oh, my, absolutely. To my meandering... Uh, my meandering gibberish. I, so. I was brought in to keep you on track. And somebody has to. Right. Somebody has to. Well, How are you this week, Joe? I'm great. How yeah. are you? You know, I'm doing pretty good. It's been uh, been not a, not a bad week at work. Flu season seems to be winding down a little bit. I should knock on wood. Um, but it's always nice when people aren't crazy sick all the time. So that's been that's been good. It's been busy in other areas, though. It has. It has been an eventful week and an eventful two weeks which i'm sure we'll catch up on yeah i mean trying to trying to keep track of everything that's going on at the capitol this week is just crazy i mean this is uh so this is deadline week so as we talked about a couple weeks ago there is a deadline every year where bills have to be heard in committee and passed out of committee in their chamber of origin Mm -hmm. and if they don't meet that deadline bill's dead can't Mm -hmm. come back Mm -hmm. um similarly there is a bill there is a date by which a bill has to be passed off the floor in its chamber of origin. And that day, as luck would have it, is today. So as we're recording, this is Thursday, March 14th, um, the House is still in session, yes. uh, passing bills, doing some, uh, doing a lot doing a lot of work. The Senate was in session until about 11.30 last night, it trying to work late. off the floor. It was, it was uh, so, a lot, lot going on. A lot going on. Then again... There always is. That's uh, that's true. So we are going to do our best today to try and bring you guys up to speed. Um, you know, it's, it's been really busy. There have been literally hundreds of bills passed in the last two weeks. So we are not going to get to everything, but we're going to try and hit the highlights and give you guys a sense of what's happening at the Capitol and what's in store moving forward. Other big news in the last two weeks, I'm sure everyone's aware, is the uh, teacher strike, the impending teacher strike that's going to be a accompanied by a strike of Oklahoma public employees. Mm-hmm. We're going to really kind of get into the nitty gritty of that later in the episode. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll do our usual news recap, let you know what's going on with the legislature, and then spend the bulk of the rest of our time talking about the teacher and public employee. Right. Work I, mean, I, I believe you have some guests. Uh, we do. We do. We've got some, we've got some audio from, we spoke to, we spoke to um, a teacher. We spoke to some families that have, kids in Oklahoma city public schools and tried to kind of get a sense, you know, I don't, I don't love the term like man on the street, but you know, it's kind of, kind of get a sense of people who are looking at kind of the consequences of this issue in their day to day life in a way that, you know, I'm not, I'm not a teacher. I don't have kids in public school. So it, it was good, I think, to get a sense of what, what people that are kind of impacted and invested in that way sure how how they feel about it so sure. we'll hear from them a little bit later great shall we get to it i'm ready all right so first segment this week don't miss this this is our weekly news roundup articles you know news articles podcast episodes tweets anything else that we think you should take a look at we are starting this week in the great state of new york the new york times had an article this week um Yesterday, there was a press conference held by Attorney General Mike Hunter and the uh, director of the Department of Corrections here in Oklahoma announcing that we are going to try to resume executions for prisoners that have been sentenced to death. Um, 
you may or may not know, we've been on hold since 2015 uh, because there were a series of executions that did not go well. They didn't go as planned. Did not go according to plan. Yeah, yeah. And, and since then, the state has really had trouble getting the cocktail of drugs that we use for lethal injections. So um, inje- uh, executions have been on hold for the last two and a half, three years. Um, and the attorney general came out yesterday and said that, you know, we've been, we've been trying to find the drugs. We can't find them. A lot of pharmaceutical companies have basically started refusing to sell these cocktail of medications to, uh, states, governments that are intending to use them for lethal injections. So the, the drugs for lethal injection are not as widely available uh, as widely available as they used to be. So, uh, the state of Oklahoma has decided that we're going to move forward and try to use a method of execution called nitrogen gas asphyxiation. Mm-hmm. Um, this has never been used in people before for execution, so it would be um, kind of um, a first. Around, it'd be a first, yeah, definitely. Um, and this was really the subject of this New York Times article. It was kind of looking at how this came about, why we're taking this method, um, and there's even some legal questions I think about whether or not we're going to be allowed to proceed. But that's where we. We're going to kick the kick the news roundup off. Kick it off. All right. Next, uh, regular fixers. You guys will remember that a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the commissioners of the land office and a proposal by Representative Gann from Inola to use funds from the commissioners of the land office uh, to use those as a potential source of uh, money for a teacher pay raise. And I kind of went off on a little rant about why that would seem not to be constitutional according to the Oklahoma constitution mm-hmm. um, and also would violate the federal enabling act. Um, at the time I did make the disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer. I cannot issue legal opinions. However, the attorney general of the state of Oklahoma, Mike Hunter is a lawyer and has now issued an opinion that says that is correct. And um, what does it say? So basically the, and we're going to post this up on the web and, and the, the article, the article in question is from news. Okay. But there's a secondary article from the Tulsa world that actually has the legal opinion. And essentially what this kind of boils down to is the, there, there was land and money that was provided to the state of Oklahoma at the time of statehood. And a condition of that land being given that land and money was that it be used for the benefit of common schools. The state holds that in trust. Okay. And part of the rules about how that trust is administered is that the principle of the trust can be increased, but it can never be diminished. And it is in the opinion of the attorney general, Mike Hunter, that Representative Gann's bill, as written, would ultimately act to diminish the principle of the trust, which would make it unconstitutional both in Oklahoma and a violation of the Enabling Act. And also a violation of the principle of a trust. (laughs) I mean, yeah, it would be a violation of like just the whole idea of holding something in trust. That's a great point. Right. So we'll get that up on the web for you. That's that's really kind of two articles in one. The main article from News OK is kind of outlining the details about what the constitutional questions and legal questions are. And then we'll link to the Tulsa World article as well that has the uh, the actual opinion from Attorney General Hunter. Next up is an article from our friends at Read Frontier, the Frontier, independent nonprofit journalism from Tulsa. So... The city of Tulsa has recently built a new city jail. And this week, there was a change in the city ordinances, or in a city ordinance, that affects how citizens who have kind of low-level criminal offenses, so think things like traffic violations, you know, other misdemeanors, you know, not, you know, not felonies, not violent crimes, when and how they can be, um, when and how they can appear in front of the court to, to rectify these outstanding issues. So I guess in the past, if, if someone missed their court date or failed to pay a fine or failed to pay a court fee, even if that was 
weeks or months overdue, they could work with an attorney. They could be added onto the docket at the city court, the municipal court, and they could appear in front of the judge and get put on a payment plan or they could pay it off or they could, you know, basically take the steps they need to take to not be arrested for having outstanding warrants and fines. And, and it sounds like it'd be a relatively easy process. Right. Right. Okay. So very straightforward. And they've, they've kind of, you know, defense attorneys in Tulsa, they've operated this way for a long time. Well, they changed this ordinance. So now if someone is, if they're failed to appear or pay a fine goes beyond 60 days, they are now legally required to surrender themselves to the city jail or they'll, a warrant will be put up for their arrest. So okay. defense attorneys are saying like, what the hell? Like, where did this come from? There was very little kind of notice served that this was going to be a change. And because they have this brand new jail, defense attorneys are kind of crying foul and saying, Hey, this is really just a way to get more people into this jail, right? Like we got this jail. Now we need to fill it up, right? We got it. So we got to use it. Um, you know, again, I am not a lawyer and I don't, I don't practice the law that I don't practice in Tulsa. So I can't, I can't offer my firsthand opinion of it, but I'll tell you, I think that the article is really interesting and definitely worth, definitely worth a read. And and how might that impact the Tulsa jail system right now? I mean, in terms of, in terms of the city jail, I think that they, I shouldn't say, I think the case that the defense attorneys are making is that like, <clears throat> you know, we use all this taxpayer money to build a jail. We should use the jail for something. Um, there's also an argument to be made that the reason they built this jail is because a lot of these kind of low level, level offenders that were winding up incarcerated were being sent to the Tulsa County jail, mm-hmm. which like many County jails in Oklahoma is massively um, kind burdened. of, yeah. It's burdened. So, so that was the reason I think for the construction of the city jail, but I think that the some of the district attorney or some of the defense attorneys that practice in Tulsa didn't see this, didn't see this coming. Okay. So. All right. So we're going to put that up on the web. Yeah, too. That'll, that'll be up on the web as Great. well. All right. Next up, our friends at Nondoc, another great uh, independent nonprofit investigative journalism site that this one's based here in Oklahoma City, um, has an article about the Wind Catcher Project. So the Wind Catcher Project is a power project, a wind turbine. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's pretty self-explanatory. A, uh, a wind turbine There's project. There's an education there. Right. It's a wind turbine project that um, has been proposed for the panhandle. Um, and it's big. How big? If it is built, it will be the largest wind energy project ever constructed in the United States. Like, it's huge. I, hmm. think, that, I think that the goal is like 800 2.5 megawatt turbines okay. that are planned. Wow. Um, this is being advocated by public service company of Oklahoma. Mm. Uh, interestingly, Walmart is a big proponent of this as well. Okay. Walmart has an agreement mm-hmm. where they would get a lot of their power from this new project. And Walmart as a company has plans to be, I think 50% renewable by 2025 and a hundred percent renewable not far after that. And you're talking about the Walmart brand, the national brand. Right. Okay. right. Yeah. Right. Um, however, the wind catcher project is facing a lot of opposition. It's facing opposition from kind of some of the usual suspects. You know, we've talked about before um, that Mr. Ham from Continental Energy has a lot of um, animosity toward wind projects. There's some other kind of players in the more traditional energy sector. There are actually some other purveyors of wind energy that are also opposed to this. Um, there was a big hearing at the Corporation Commission um, earlier this week, kind of talking about the project, merits, demerits whether it should go forward. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's a, the, the article, it's pretty lengthy. It gets into a lot of detail. It is absolutely worth your time to any check indi- out. Any indication of how conservation groups are responding to this news? When you say conservation, do you mean energy conservation groups? Do you mean uh, like, uh, like environmental, environmental, environmental groups? Conservation. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know that. I mean, have you heard anything? I haven't heard that off the top of my head. Do you know? I, I haven't to this specific project, but I have in the past heard about, um, uh, environmental conservation groups opposing uh, wind turbines as they tend to interfere with um, bird migrations. So I was just going to say things like that. Migratory bird patterns. Migratory bird patterns. That's it. You got it. You know, I've never gotten to say that on the pod, but I can check it off my bucket list. It's another first. Migratory bird patterns. John, sure. John co-hosts first. Right, and you get to say, uh, uh, you know, something you've been wanting to say for a long time. Oh man, it's a good day. Wow, it's a good day. Let's go for three. Oh well, well I'm sure we'll find something. 
All right. Lastly, our fifth fifth article for the weekend. And this is the hot topic. It is. This is so. This is, you know, I I try really hard not to prioritize our news roundup. Like I think anything that we put up, we feel like is worth reading for a, a lot of reasons. But if you're gonna read, if you're only gonna read one thing this week, this last one is the one that you should check out. So, Oklahoma Watch. Um, investigative journalism, again, nonprofit here in Oklahoma City, has a great, great piece up uh, that's talking about the teacher strike. The piece really does a couple of things. So, as we will, as we have talked about at length uh, previously, and as we'll get into more here in a little bit, um, several revenue measures have been proposed. In, in the House and the Senate to try and bring in more money to the state treasury for the purposes of funding a lot of things, but particularly a $5,000 teacher pay raise. As yet, none of those have garnered the necessary 75% threshold to pass into law. Um, the most recent plan, Step Up, failed by a pretty significant margin, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and Oklahoma Watch contacted all the legislatures, all the legislators that voted against the Step Up plan. They heard back from 17 of them, I believe. Wow. Uh, And this article details the responses that they got from all 17 legislators who who, who responded to that inquiry. Um, And the, their responses are illuminating. The other reason I would say that that article is really worth your time is because the second half is one of the Q and A's. I think Oklahoma Watch really does a great job of coming up with like, here's kind of frequently asked questions for a particular issue. And so the rest of the article deals with some of the facts about a potential teacher, public employee walkout, right? You know, where can you get childcare? What about kids who depend on schools for lunches? You know, is this legal? Are teachers allowed to strike? Um, It's really, it's good, interesting reading. Um, And I think that this is an issue that's going to affect I mean, virtually everyone who lives in Oklahoma, one way or the other. So, if you're gonna win, if you're gonna read one thing this week, I would it, check that out. And it's pressing because we're talking about something that is tentatively scheduled for early April. Yeah, two so weeks. We are weeks away. Yeah, two weeks and four days. Wow. So great. All right, John. Any uh, any thoughts? Thoughts on the news roundup? Thoughts on any of the, any, any of these that you found particularly compelling? Or well, I do think that the hot topic, wh- whether we you know are going to acknowledge it or not, is this teacher walkout. And and when you consider that state employees are considering planning a stoppage, and we we don't know what that entails, and we honestly, we don't know what the teacher walkout entails. Is this something that's going to last for several days? Um, You know, what's the potential impact of that? You know, I mean, it it would be extremely informative um, to know kind of what it, what is the pram you know what does that look like and also what does the stoppage look like for the state employees because we're talking about something that could could have a lot of impact um, on uh, unintended populations those individuals seeking those services or those students that are in school so absolutely absolutely all right well that is the news roundup for the week we are going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a minute for your legislative recap. And we're back. We're going to move on to our legislative recap. You know, Let's as, do it. As we mentioned at the top, there have been, I mean, hundreds of bills that have been heard and passed. And even if you follow uh, uh, Capitol, the uh, official Oklahoma House and Oklahoma Senate Twitter accounts, and you get, like, not notifications, but every single bill that comes up shows up in your feed, and then the vote shows up It's in still your feed. too much. It's still a lot. Yeah. There's yeah. just no possible way to keep up with all of it. So we are going to kind of divide this week's legislative recap into three sections. Um, basically, yeah, win, lose, or draw, right? Uh, I want to emphasize here, winners, we are not putting bills in the winning category to signify that I or Joe or Let's Fix This endorses these bills. We're simply saying these bills won because they passed, okay? Um, if and they we- lost... Because, because they, they did didn't not. pass, right? So don't take the category win, lose, or draw as a 
an, an endorsement or a comment on the merits of the bill from our perspective. And to be clear, a draw means that we're still waiting for yes. new information. The House we're going to see what happens. House is in session as we speak. Uh, Senate may have some work to do tonight, so we're going to we're going to see. So, uh, first up, uh, House Bill 1530. This is a bill sponsored by Representative Jason Dunnington from House District 88. Uh, this is an equal pay bill. So Tell the, us about it. So, the short story the short story on 1530, this is a bill that Representative Dunnington has been working on for a number of years, and it prohibits it previously in Oklahoma, if you w- were to inquire about your pay to your supervisor um, or even your fellow employees, okay, um, you were not protected from retaliation by your supervisor or your employer. And this bill outlaws that. So this means that, you know, I, Scott, I can go to my supervisor and ask, what do I make relative to my colleagues? The reason this is important is because, in particular, women are systematically underpaid substantially. It varies from industry to industry, but as a, as a cohort, women are significantly underpaid compared to their male counterparts. And this is a bill that, one, protects women from inquiring about their pay, their compensation relative to their male counterparts but also kind of reinforces that you're not allowed to do that right you can't you can't discriminate in pay based on gender a hot topic not only locally but nationally so does it say uh, is there a provision that allows for folks to go in uh, regardless of gender and ask a gender specific question about pay to say hey uh you know i am a male uh, employee here what do I make relative to my female counterparts? Or is it just a general, I can go and say, what do I make comparative to the other managers here? I think it's comparative to other employees of your rank and experience. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think the gender specific questions would be included in that. um, But I think it's even more broad than that. So it's just other employees of your kind of rank and your rank and uh, experience Experience and and maybe tenure with the company. Sure. Okay. So, and where's this bill at, Scott? Uh, So passed out of the house. So was in committee, passed out of committee. It's passed off the floor of the house. It'll now be heard in the Senate. Senate. Well, we think it'll be heard in the Senate. That's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Um, The Senate author is Senator Stephanie Bice. um, Okay. Mm -hmm. Republican. So this is a bill Mm -hmm. that's got broad bipartisan support um, in both chambers. um, And I think it's a really good chance of, passing the Senate and ultimately, be si- ultimately being signed into law. Okay. Any word on the street about support? Um, you know, there was some resistance, some resistance in the House. The main, the main pockets of resistance are people that saying that this uh, potentially hurts small businesses. Um, mm. <laughs> the comeback from the supporters of the bill is, hey, you know discrimination is illegal already. So mm-hmm. this bill makes it, um, makes it easier to find out if discrimination is happening. Um, so if that is going to be an impediment to your operations as a business manager, that's a problem that you already have. This bill just makes it easier to point that out. Interesting. Okay, so. great. Cool. Next up, SB 1086, Senate Bill 1086. This is a bill we've actually, it's not a bill that we've talked about a ton on the pod. But an but issue we've certainly had conversation about. Yeah, you want to, I mean, you want to kind of take the lead and in, in Tell, tell everybody what what this does. This, this is capital gains yeah. exemption. Yeah. yeah, no, lead us on. All right, so capital gains exemption. This is one that, you know, um, this is a bill that says for the sale of certain kind of investments, for the money that you get from certain kinds of, you know, whether it's property or stocks, um, you know, in money that you have made from the sale of investments, you're allowed to deduct and essentially not pay income taxes on in Oklahoma. Does not count towards your gross household income. Right. And the reason that matters is because the thought when this bill was passed or when this law went into effect was that this would spur investment in the state of Oklahoma. However, recently, a report by an outside agency found that the... that And, and, and to be clear, why would it have implied that? Yeah, so the idea is that by saying we're going to not tax the capital gains from investments, that encourages people to, okay, well, if I can make money and not pay taxes on the money, then I'm going to I'm gonna try and do that. So I'm going to take steps to make these investments 
because the the proceeds are tax free. So it's an incentive to invest money rather than sticking it in the bank, right? Rather than putting it in, you know, a savings account or 401k, this is the incentive to buy that rental property or, you know, um, purchase that stock option or maybe invest in a startup as a as an individual household or as a business individual okay individual now that's the thought whether that actually has happened in practice it, it seems really not to be the case so um part of the never-ending quest to find revenue for the state of oklahoma has been to look at certain tax exemptions and see like do these make sense there's a commission that was created ex- explicitly to do that. This commission, they hired an outside agency, this agency conducted an audit, and the short story is this is estimated, this 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 rule, this capital gains exemption, is estimated to have cost Oklahoma about $450 million, something like $100, $120 million annually, while actually only bringing in $9 million, which seems like a pretty shoddy investment. Interesting. Um, so there's been a drumbeat for at least the last year. To so re- projection? To- uh, anybody out there talking about how that might change in year two, three? Well, so it's been so it's been five years, I think, I think, since it's been into effect. And so these are real numbers. The numbers wow. are... Like that, it's cost. It has cost the state four hundred and sixty something million dollars, four hundred fifty, and has brought in nine million. Um, so there's been a drumbeat to get this off the books. It doesn't seem like it's in a, it's it's not an incentive that that makes sense. And I put this here because it did, it did it passed the Senate today, which is a big deal. A lot of um, advocacy groups have been pushing for this to be repealed for a long time. But the other reason that I put it in here was that the debate for this bill in the Senate was striking um the the only people who debated in favor of this right and so i want to be real clear here being in favor of this bill means you want to get rid of this tax break every single person who voted in favor of it was republican and 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 some republicans that are pretty conservative Mm -hmm. and and making a really good case from a business and fiscal responsibility standpoint in the senate that this is not something that makes sense for Oklahoma. Now, myself, that's a stance that I completely agree with, but I feel like that is not an argument that I feel like is made as eloquently as as the senators made it today, um, as often as I would hope. Hmm. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it was it was really um, it was it was a little, it was a little inspiring, honestly, <laughs> to watch um, because. To, to see people from you know both parties really come together and say, this is not something that makes sense for us. Maybe this is not working. Yeah, um, it was able to pass. It's uh, it was able to pass the Senate. Um, it's not a revenue raising measure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not written as a revenue raising measure. So re- revenue raising measure. So it didn't require a supermajority to pass. Right, which is good. Um, it is also it is important to remember that this is estimated to cost the state. $120 million annually, but this is not a tax, right? This is not like you can't point to like, this does not provide for the bringing in of new revenue. This okay. basically means that we would expect next year, the tax collections coming into the state would be higher because this law isn't on the books, but it doesn't create mm-hmm. an, it doesn't mm-hmm. create a new source of revenue. Right. If that makes sense. Right. So that was SB 1086. Um, we'll kind of run through these next couple. Um, there's a bill that passed the house today, house joint resolution 1050. Um, this is an interesting bill. Again, it kind of <laughs> speaker, uh, not speaker. Um, we're back to revenue raising thresholds, here. <laughs> right? Um, uh, uh, Scott Inman, who was formerly the democratic leader, the minority leader in the house. Um, he debated, uh, against this bill today. And so did uh, Representative John Bennett from Salazar. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. Interesting pair. It's it's so interesting that uh, Representative Inman made the comment on the floor, on the record, as part of his debate. It's not often that you see uh, John Bennett and I debating in favor of the same bill. Uh, when I found out that was going to happen, I had to reread the bill real quick to make sure that it does what I think it does. <laughs> um, wow! I, I thought that was I thought that was entertaining. So give the give the listeners at home quick rundown and say why that might be ironic. Uh, it's ironic because uh, Representative Inman is one of the most liberal members of the House of Representatives on many issues, and former Democratic leader uh, Representative Bennett from Zalasaw 
is arguably the most conservative member. Um, it, again, on fiscal issues, particularly. Um, and why did they come together to? That is an interesting question. So House Joint Resolution uh, 1050, this would put a vote, uh, it would put a measure on the ballot in November mm -hmm. that would amend State Question 640. As our listeners are no doubt familiar, State Question 640 is the provision in the Oklahoma Constitution that requires a 75% supermajority in both houses of the legislature to raise any kind of tax. This bill would lower that threshold from 75% to two-thirds. Um, Three-quarters to two-thirds. Right. Um, so you had some interesting coalitions. Really, I think the most interesting coalition is the coalition that formed against the bill, um, which is a section of really conservative Republicans who said, basically, hell no, we shouldn't make it easier to raise taxes. Um, raising taxes should be as hard as possible. But you also That's had... A fiscally responsible, uh, conservative point of view. Right. But then you also had some of the Dems, you know, that are kind of you know, fairly progressive, and they had two arguments. Well, I shouldn't say that. They had one argument. Their argument is this bill would make it easier to raise what in their mind is the wrong kind of tax. So mm -hmm. one of the points of opposition that many of the Democrats have had to some of the revenue re raising measures that have been proposed is that they feel the taxes are too, pro too regressive. So they disproportionately affect the poor mm -hmm. and they have blocked many of these revenue raising measures or they've been part of the group. I should, I'm not trying to say the Dems have, you know, I'm not trying to say the Democrats are at fault for not, having new revenue, but certainly many Democrats have been part of the group that has voted against some of the revenue raising measures. And they have done that because they feel like they're too regressive and they, they tax poor people much more than they tax people that are at the wealthier end of the spectrum. And so they don't want to see the threshold for revenue measures be lowered mm -hmm. so that the majority could pass what they see as really regressive taxes with no check. So you essentially have members of a very minority party and uh, members of a very majority party coming together to say we should not lower the threshold uh, uh, that it would take to pass uh, certain yeah. legislation. Yeah, and both I, both arguing in favor of keeping the supermajority, which I found yeah. just interesting. Um, next up is a bill. This is Senate Bill 1140. Senate Bill 1140 is a bill that deals with adoption. Um, so this was an issue near and dear to your heart. It is. This is an issue that um, uh, affects me uh, kind of peripherally um, because my wife works for a ch in, an agency that um, takes care of kids that are in DHS custody. Mm -hmm. DHS custody. Custody. Um, Senate Bill 1140 was proposed because there are some... There are some agencies in Oklahoma that take care of kids in state custody and work to find them foster homes and adoptive homes. However, th they these agencies in particular are faith-based, and they want to, to be able to adhere to their kind of statements of faith and what they believe about the Bible most of the time um, when they're determining where to place children and we have some very big players in the faith-based community helping to drive this right right and and so basically what this bill says is that if i'm a child placing agency i can accept kids from dhs custody that are in dhs custody into my agency i can accept dhs funds to help take care of them but if i want to deny a family the privilege of adopting one of those kids because this family um, doesn't adhere to what my statement of faith says should be their lifestyle. Um, I can say no. We're not going to. We're not going to adopt that family. And this is a piece of legislation that, that looks very much like pieces of legislation that have been passed in other states. Yeah, that's correct. So, states like Alabama, South Dakota, Texas, uh, and uh, some that are pending in Georgia and Kansas, mm -hmm. and even a bill that looks similar in the U S Congress. Right. Right. And you know, there's, there's two kind of sides to this. So the people that are pushing this bill, which are the faith-based nonprofits that are involved in child placement, their argument is, Hey, there are lots of agencies 
that want to help take care of DHS kids, Mm -hmm. but they're not doing it right now because they are afraid that, and we're just going to come out and say it, the first time they refuse to adopt a child into a gay or lesbian family, they're going to be hit with a lawsuit. That's their... So this bill is being packaged as a preventative measure uh, for to protect agencies that are faith-based um, from ever having to field a lawsuit for selective uh, adoption. Yeah, right. I mean, that's exactly it. Um, and And have there been any lawsuits in the state of Oklahoma thus far? No, it's never happened. It's never happened in Oklahoma. Interesting. Yeah. So that's not a lawsuit that's ever, has never happened. Um, but the argument from the people pushing the bill is if you push, the, if you put this legal protection in place, you may have, you will have many agencies that are kind of sitting on the sidelines, step into the arena and try to help start adopting these kids out to families. So that's the argument in favor of the bill. Hmm. But the argument against the bill is that, this is allowing taxpayer dollars to go to agencies that are practicing religious discrimination. Um, And the argument from several of the people opposing the bill on the floor of the Senate was that, you know, we've never had a lawsuit over this issue, but as soon as we pass this bill, we're going to. Um, Mm -hmm. And that has been the case in some other states that laws like this get passed and then are immediately challenged in the courts. Um, there, none of those have gone to the level of the, uh, to the level of the Supreme court as yet. And so, you know, I don't know what the outcome of that would be, but interesting. Anyway, the bill passed off the floor of the Senate on Monday. And to be clear, the state of Oklahoma and a lot of other nonprofit agencies that are involved in adopting out, uh, do not discriminate based on those things. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Next up is Senate Bill 1195. Uh, Joe, take us away. Yeah. So so this is a bill that is being uh, spearheaded to allow additional types of gaming in casinos in the state of Oklahoma, particularly on uh, uh, tribal lands. So uh, there are a number of casinos in Oklahoma that are operating entirely on uh, what are card-based games. And the idea is, is that if you introduce uh, roulette and dice type of games in those uh, places, that you can increase the amount of revenue that will come in uh, to the state. Uh, basically, there is an opinion that if you are a casino operator in the state, that you are losing business to other states by not operating the full kind of gamut of, of gaming styles. Now, I'm not a gambler, so... Uh, I have not spent significant time inside of casinos as a participant, but I do understand um, from the uh, from what's out there that this could conservatively bring in in year two forty nine million dollars in revenue to the state. I mean that's substantial. It's a, it's significant. You can't, you can't. I mean you can't sneeze right. at fifty million bucks, right? Right. Right. And I mean, you know, I don't <laughs> I don't have I don't have data to support this, and I would also say. I would also say I'm not a gambler. You know, I, you know, I play poker occasionally. Um, we might enjoy. have made a side bet, you and I, here it's and there. True. And it, it's true. It probably wasn't for money. Um, but I'll say it. Bet. You know, bet. Anytime, anytime I've been in Vegas, you know, when I go to Vegas, uh, I don't I don't sit at the slots. Um, I don't sit at the card tables. I mean, maybe, maybe a hand of blackjack here and there. But if I want to go to Vegas and I want to gamble and have a good time, dude, I, I personally, I'm at the craps table. So, like, is this cra- is this is this a game that would is is like, are we gonna have craps in Oklahoma now? Yes, we could. I mean, so the Senate has voted thirty to, to sixteen on this measure, and and what what it's been descri- it's been uh, given the uh, metaphor of kind of what we have in the past done with alcohol, right? And the, the the way that we do gaming in the state of Oklahoma has been referred to by proprietors of gaming institutions. As gambling 3.2, right? <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> it's essentially gambling light, right? Okay. And and so what what the folks that are in support of this bill are looking for is to expand the gaming options for the folks that are already coming to the casinos or who would otherwise be coming to the casinos instead of going all the way to Vegas. Right. So, yeah, you could see right. craps, uh, other variants. I'm not... Uh, that I mean, well that's informed about what all the dice games are out there, but right. you'd see more. You would see specifically dice games and roulette. Is Pi Gal a dice game? No, Pi Gal's a card game, right? Isn't Pi Gal a card game? Yeah, I, I, I actually don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, have you have you ever played craps? 
Yes. Dude. Yes, once. Craps was a good time. Yes, and I also rolled dice on occasion in high school, right? You know, just uh, in the back of uh, the school. And so, I, I, I mean, I get it. I think what they're saying is that folks that are serious about their gaming or who are, are you know, super excited about exploring gaming yeah. like to play dice games, roulette, sort of those games that are not the traditional card games. And yeah. this bill, 1140, or I'm, excuse me, 1195, would expand the gaming options Um at those places. And I do want to say that the other great thing about this bill is potentially the amount of jobs that it could create, right? So right now you have folks working in the casinos at specific games. You add games, you add employees. I think that's what people that are proponents of this bill are really looking at. It's revenue and it's jobs. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, moving on. Uh, Senate Bill 1030. Uh, This is one we've talked about briefly uh, in the last episode. I'll give a quick summary, and then, Joe, I'm going to ask you to make, you know, just a little bit bit of commentary and context here. So 1030, this is a bill that lowers the threshold at which people qualify for Medicaid, which is also called Sooner Care in Oklahoma. Um, So if if we're getting real technical, the bill directs, the healthcare authority of Oklahoma to approach the federal government and ask the federal government for a waiver, which would allow us to decrease the threshold at which families in Oklahoma are eligible to quali- qualify for sooner care. That's right. Essentially asking for permission to lower. Right. Right. And it would take it to 20% of the federal poverty level, which okay. is, uh, I would think like right around, I mean, the, the poverty level depends on your family size and some other things but right. this would be this would be a significant decrease from where our sooner care threshold sits now and, um, and you know what it is in terms of income i mean w- w- what does that decrease mean for numbers of income so amount of income so the, i think the best number that kind of illustrates it is that a a single mom this is and this number comes from oklahoma policy institute this is their estimate okay that a single mom who has two kids who makes three hundred and forty six dollars a month would no longer qualify for sooner care. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, Joe, I, I mean, do you just kind of want to talk for a minute and just like, what, what, are you, what can you kind of put in context for us about, you know, I, I the argument I think here from this and then another bill we'll get to here, here get to here in a minute is that there are people that are kind of freeloading. You know, they're taking advantage of the system. They don't need these services. They can afford the health care. They can afford the food stamps. They can afford these things. And they're just depending on the taxpayer to subsidize their their lifestyle. I mean, I don't know. What's, what's kind of your – that's that's the argument that I feel like I hear from the folks that propose these sorts of bills. What, what would you say to that? Yeah. I, what I would say is that it, that exists. You know, I'm, I'm fairly sure of it. I'm sure that there are folks out there that are, um, for lack of a better way to put it, gaming the system. Okay. Uh, what my concern as somebody who works in the nonprofit field and, and who's doing this pod on behalf of a nonprofit is that we are limiting, we're putting an additional barrier in um, for individuals that are seeking service. Right. And, and I think that if you're involved in the nonprofit or public sector out there, that's always a concern for uh, those types of institutions is that, you know, you're already a single mother of two, depending on, um, you know, predictors like education, um, career history, um, skills, uh, things like that. We're really talking about access. So, so as a single mother of two or, you know, whatever your situation is, do you have access to this service or this benefit or this, uh, well, taxpayer benefit, right? Um, and is this limiting the number of individuals that can likewise access that? I mean, are we making the pot smaller for uh, folks that are uh, living with a lot of barriers? And are we sticking another one in there? And I think that's the concern that anyone would have uh, just in looking at. I do have to disclose that I am not as familiar with the bill as you are working in the healthcare industry. Um, so the, just coming from a, a background of working with individuals uh, uh, in the nonprofit sector over employment, um, this would be a concern for me in terms of are we putting uh, an additional burden on folks that are already trying to access numerous services 
um, to get back on their feet, to get a, you know, a hand up, not a hand out. So uh, that's my concern with it. So that's the last of the winners. Next on to the losers. And again, winners and losers is not meant to uh, signify an endorsement of any bill or our opinion about any bill. This is simply a reflection of whether or not they passed or did not. Um, first up in our losers uh, section is Senate Bill 1120. This is Senator Yen's medical marijuana bill. Mm-hmm. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. This would be a bill that should state question 788 pass in June. This is a bill that would kind of rein it in a little bit. It delineates specific conditions for which medical marijuana can be prescribed. Um, that had passed out of committee with the title stricken. It did not pass off the floor. There was some debate. It wasn't... <laughs> Honestly, it wasn't super. It wasn't super interesting. It just it didn't pass. I think that the the kind of the gestalt is no one wants to do a lot with medical marijuana until they see how the state question goes. And so this is a further uh, implication for the types of things that medical marijuana can be prescribed for. Yeah, yeah. So this would this would limit more of a specification, right? So or a limitation. All right. Next, we have Senate Bill. 1104. Now, this is the lunch shaming bill, and we'll talk about exactly what that means. Um, I included this for several reasons. One, I think it's a good bill. Two, it's a good process uh, illustration. And three, this is a bill that I think is near and dear to both you and I. Uh, I One, because we think it's a good bill, but two, I uh, am good friends with one of the chief advocates for this bill. You are Um, indeed. uh, You have... Also I, a close relationship with one of the chief advocates for this bill. That's right. I, I was fortunate enough to be a part of the Hunger Action Day uh, that was up at the Capitol to kind of talk to our legislators about this bill specifically. And I happen to be married to somebody that is uh, a, a chief advocate of this and uh, believes deeply uh, in its purpose. Can you kind of tell us about the bill, like what it what it does, and then we'll get into what happened? Yeah, I can. In the, I just want to point out that this is a bill that has broad bipartisan support, and it, it didn't show up on our losers list because it was voted down. I mean, this is a bill that just didn't make the cut. And we, we mentioned earlier in the pod that um, there are a lot of uh, deadlines, and uh, this is something that just did not make the deadline today. It was bumped from yesterday. And so it, uh, it's not a dead issue, and um, we are both, and probably a lot of listeners uh, are uh, behind seeing this issue uh, revisited in the future by this legislature. And, and what this bill does is it seeks to uh, sort of destigmatize um, not being able to pay for your uh, lunch a, a, as a student in school. And, and, and what you see uh, sometimes, and these are localized decisions, uh, is uh, individuals who can't afford to pay the balance of their free, uh, of their lunch, um, having to do things to uh, sort of let the rest of the world know that I'm somebody that can't pay for my lunch, right? So you may see that in a variety of different manifestations, right? So you might see a hand stamp. You might have to uh, see kids sign up for it, and that could be in a, a very open environment in a school. And I think probably the one that strikes me the most is you might have to work it off. You might have to work the balance of your lunch bill off as a student um, that cannot afford to pay for lunch. And this is, like I said, it passed out of committee. It had, uh, I think it had bipartisan co-authors, didn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Right? AJ dev- Griffin was uh, a sponsor, and so was uh, Mickey Dolan's yeah. was uh, signed on. So, so bipartisan authorship, bipartisan support. This is just one that um, really just because of time, you know, today I think the Senate Senate floor agenda today had like 50, 60 bills on it, which is I just, mean, we're watching it right now. Yeah, you know, like it's still, like it's still going on. So this is just one that it didn't it it didn't get hurt. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's not going to get hurt again. You know, we referenced a bill earlier by a Representative Joseph Dunnington, a House Bill fifteen thirty, the Equal Pay Bill. Um, Representative Dunnington has been working on that bill for four years, right? That's right. And and so sometimes uh, the you know the pace of change I think can sometimes be frustrating and glacial, but the fact that uh, lunch shaming isn't getting her this year doesn't mean that it's not going to. So That's right. And a lot of advocates still behind it, still bipartisan support. And um, again, uh, this does not cost the state a dime. 
Absolutely. Implement this. So, all right. And then last, lastly, we've got two bills that have not yet been heard, but I still think are worthy of discussion. In the draw. In the this is our draw category. And uh, John, you've got Senate Bill 1212. This is a bill That's that right. I am not super familiar with. So if you can educate me and the listeners, That's what's okay. going on with uh, SB 1212? So SB 1212 is a bill aimed at uh, where you can carry concealed and on some occasion unconcealed guns. I feel it's an important topic because there's a lot of national developments and local developments about concealed carry on schools. And let me let me break this down for a second. SB 1212 would make it unlawful to conceal carry in places owned by the city, town, state, etc., your public um, entities, your courts, jails, detention centers, etc., again, and public private elementary schools, public private sports rev, uh, venues, and where you can gamble legally, essentially, okay? The one caveat is back to that public-private uh, schools, okay? There is a caveat that says that you can conceal or unconceal carry a weapon in a private school property and or a bus vehicle, some mode of transportation, if the governing body of the private school adopts a policy that says you can't. And furthermore, you can uh, conceal carry in a public school, uh, it, a, a conceal carry by a designated uh, person. I should note that, right? So, so whatever that means um, to that area. If the school board adopts a policy. So I thought that was of interest. I mean, I mean it's a hot topic nationally. It's a hot topic locally. This is a, a bill that on the surface, until you get into those subsections, looks like areas you cannot carry it does however make an exception for public and private schools under certain circumstances so i will say that pursuant to all the information that is out there clearly you have uh, uh, folks that are gonna probably come out and oppose this this is a bill that has not made it out of its uh second hearing it was registered as a second hearing today and um you're going to have folks that oppose this bill because it it introduces the possibility of either concealed or unconcealed weapons in schools by people who are registered to carry them for lack of a better way to put it. And then you're going to have folks that are uh, in support of this type of bill because um, it contributes to school safety. And so that's where the divide is on this Senate bill. It has not, um, for for a lot of reasons, I think there's a lot of issues out there that are really important. It has not gotten a lot of attention, and perhaps it's because if, if you read through the first couple of of areas of the bill, it talks about where you cannot carry, uh, okay, and then it allows that sub. Those, there are some subsections that do allow uh, if the provisions are in place. So if those policies are adopted by either the school or the governing body or the school board, that's you know that's really interesting because. So Representative Cootie mm-hmm. um, had three gun bills uh, in the House that that all passed out of committee, and he had he had one that was very similar to that last subsection. Mm-hmm. So he had one, and it, 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 it skipped that whole part about all the places that you can't. He had one that was just delineating schools and basically giving the uh, authority to decide who can and can't carry in public schools. To local school boards, right? Um, so that's 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 interesting. Yeah. That so we had- as a state, it takes ownership of uh, you know your court areas or perhaps your your state funded buildings and, and things like that. But it definitely delineates localized control in terms of the schools. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, you can see where this is is going in terms of its uh, pro and against uh, sure. arguments. Sure. And, and definitely one to watch. So we're going to keep an eye on this bill. Sure, sure. And then lastly, here in the legislative recap is House Bill 3556, Medicaid. This is, this is a bill, again, it's a sooner care bill. This is a bill that passed out of committee as of this recording has not been heard on the floor of the House. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hearing that it may not be. That's we'll see if it is, is that or what not. the streets are saying? That's, that's what the streets are saying. Okay. Um, um, this is a bill that would add a work requirements Medicaid. So it basically would take families that... Uh, benefit from sooner care and say that unless you work 
a certain number of hours per week, then you don't qualify for the benefit. We have both uh, had sort of overlap with this issue. We have both seen individuals that rely on this healthcare system uh, encounter barriers in, in one form or another. And again, I go back to uh, what I said earlier, which is that simply, is it a good idea to put another barrier on individuals that are experiencing a, a good, a fair number of barriers? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that's exactly it. So, so we're going to keep an eye on this one because it's personally close to us. And we're going to keep an eye on SB 1212 because it is a hot button issue. But they have until midnight tonight. Right. Well, we're going to, I mean, we're going to keep an eye on it right now. As we're looking we, at it right as now. We, yeah. As we speak. So, all right. That is our legislative recap. That was, that was a doozy. So, we are going to take a break. When we come back, very um, quick break. Quick break. When we come back, we are going to have some interviews that I was uh, able to get some, some just time chatting with um, a teacher in Oklahoma City Public Schools as well as a family in Oklahoma City Public Schools and kind of get their, their thoughts on where we're at and why and you know what what message they want to deliver to legislatures so with that we'll be right back welcome back everyone if you've been paying attention to current events in Oklahoma for the last several weeks, you know, reading your favorite newspaper, listening to the pod, spending any time on social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc., I'm sure you're aware that teachers in Oklahoma have been threatening to go on strike or walk out of the classroom. This has been a hot topic of conversation, and for a while it looked like maybe it was just kind of theoretical, but now it seems like it's actually something that's that's coming becoming more certain by the day. I think the reasons for why teachers would do this have been pretty well explored both here on the pod and in other places, but just a quick recap. Teachers in Oklahoma have been one of the some of the lowest paid educators uh, certainly in our region or anywhere in the United States for several years if not decades. Um, teachers in Oklahoma currently are paid worse or lower than educators in any other state. Uh, additionally, education funding in Oklahoma has been dramatically cut over the last 10 to 12 years to the tune of something like 28%. So all of this adds up to a situation where teachers not only seem to feel that they are not being compensated in a way that they deserve for their level of education and the work that they put in, but even at their job, they don't have the resources that they need. We decided, or we thought, that it would be worthwhile to reach out to some families and even a teacher or two and kind of get their thoughts. How do they feel about a strike? What do they think are the causes? What message would they like to give to the legislature? And what do they see happening moving forward? So that's what we did. I sat down with a family who has children in Oklahoma City Public Schools, as well as one of Oklahoma City Public Schools teachers, uh, and just spent a few minutes with them getting their thoughts. I hope you enjoy. Can you tell us your name? Ryan Marshall. And Jen Marshall. What district do you guys live in? Uh, we're in OKCPS. Oklahoma City Public Schools. Have you always lived in Oklahoma City Public Schools, or did you move into the district recently, or how long have you been in Oklahoma City? Um, we have been in uh, Oklahoma City Public Schools for eight years now. Um, we moved into Oklahoma City from Edmond, so our... Um, our kids were in uh, Edmond Public Schools for two years, three years. Yeah, three years. Yep. Excellent. You've been in OKCPS for eight years now. And you have how many kids that are in the public school system? We have two sons, eighth grade and tenth grade. Very cool. Eighth grade and tenth grade. Well, what, as parents of kids that are in public schools here in Oklahoma City, how do you feel about just the state of education in Oklahoma generally or Oklahoma City public schools more specifically? It's struggling, and we're sad to see that. I think there are pockets that really shine for Oklahoma City, but as a whole, it's a district that is struggling financially, um, just like most of the state, and also struggling to retain quality teachers for our schools. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as a state in general, 
Um, I think the you know education in Oklahoma has really struggled. Um, definitely, uh, f- you know, financially um, has has been a challenge um, for Oklahoma schools. We just don't have the resources. We don't have the um, you know the the finances to pay teachers what they deserve. Um, my feeling is is that we've looked at education as an expense instead of an investment, and I think that's really hurt our state. Do you is there anything that you see as kind of the root cause of that, or maybe another way to ask that question is what do you see as maybe the potential impediments to improving the state of education in Oklahoma from your standpoint? Um, uh, you know, like I like I said, I you know, to me, education, I it, I, I place a huge value on education for. Um, you know, for my kids and really just for, for anybody in general. Um, and to me, it is an investment. I mean, it costs, you know, it costs to send, you know, send kids to school. It costs to, you know, to send kids to college, you know, and you save, you, you try to save and, and, and you look at that as, as an investment and not as, as an expense. And I think overall, as a state, um, we viewed it as an expense. And so we've been very reluctant to, um, to put money into it, to find money whenever, you know, um, whenever times are, are tough, we don't, you know, we, we haven't, uh, you know, done the hard things and made the hard decisions to, to, you know, to raise revenue, um, to put that towards education, you know, for an improvement for our state. So, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard, maybe you haven't, I assume you have about the possibility of a, a work stoppage or a strike for teachers that may happen, you know, here in the next several weeks, um, there's been a lot of talk in the papers about it, referencing the strike that may happen here, what's been going on in West Virginia. I guess, first of all, do you guys have strong feelings about this one way or the other? I don't have strong feelings about a strike or a walkout. I have strong feelings that teachers do need an increase in pay and that our schools need to be better resourced with the uh, materials that they need, with the resource support staff that they need. Um, I have questions about a strike. Is it a strike? Is it a walkout? Is it one day? How long is it? How does this affect testing for children? And I'm not talking just state testing, but advanced placement testing for kids going into college or um, international back international baccalaureate testing for students at certain schools. Um, I just have a lot of questions that I not sure how this is going to impact the state of the schools. I hope it is effective to the legislation and has um, sheds a huge spotlight on an area that is um, struggling for sure. Um, but I'm not sure what is the plan. I'm not sure what, what we're looking at. Are we talking two months where kids aren't in school? Are we talking just a day? Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges that we have as a state is, you know, the the 75% threshold to raise revenue. I think that presents some um, some unique challenges for Oklahoma that would be different for West Virginia or whenever the strike happened in, in 1990. Um, I think it's, as we have seen over the past year, how difficult it is to raise revenue in Oklahoma. Um, so I think with the, you know, with a strike, um, you know, I, I have questions about how long it's going to last. And, you know, you know, honestly, I, I'm a little cynical about our, our state, you know, legislators of whether they will actually do what needs to be done. Um, I, I have grave concerns about, um, about whether they're willing to make tough decisions and, you know, r- raise revenue and come to, you know, t- come to some sort of consensus among, you know, both sides to, to make that happen. Um, I've just seen, you know, with, with things that have gone on the past year, um, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's really, really hard in Oklahoma to make that happen with that 75% threshold. Yeah, and, you know, in particular, you know, we consider that that 75% was state, state question 640 that was passed yes. as a response to the last teacher strike. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll see what's going to happen. Um, last question I have for you guys, and you're welcome to share any other parting thoughts um, that you have, is what what message 
is there anything beyond what you've already said here that you would like to send to the people at 23rd and Lincoln that are, you know, kind of supposed to be, you know, um, making these decisions for us and kind of fighting these battles on behalf of the rest of us? Yeah, I mean, I think it's time to get it done. I mean, I think we, like I, like I said before, it's an investment in our state. And um, we're, we are, without raising revenue for education, we are crippling our state. I mean, and to be honest with you, I am encouraging my kids, you know, look outside of Oklahoma, to be honest with you. I mean, that's really sad to say, and it really hurts to say that because I grew up here. I'm from Oklahoma. Um, but the opportunities here are from what, you know, especially over the past eight years, we, we've seen it. We've seen what's happened to education. It, yes, we that. feel it. <laughs> we feel, we have felt in our home the, you know, um, what's happened to education. We see it every single day. We see the challenges that, are fa- that we face. Um, for example, math teachers, we have, I can't tell you how many math teachers we've been through or we lose math teachers right in the middle of the year. Um, it's, it's been really, really hard um on on our kids you know that it, it and so like i say I, I i want our legislators to get it done you know in order for our state to, to to thrive and survive and be the state that it can be we need solid education we have to have education quality education in this state in order for this state to to be what it can be I would just ask the legislators to um, look at the bigger picture. And like Ryan said, it's an investment. We've got to look to the future of the state of Oklahoma. It needs to run on more than just oil and gas. Um, We need to build a a broader um, opportunity base for our kids and show the kids and the teachers and the staff of all of our districts that we actually care, that we value what they do and the time and their own money that they spend um, to to give their lives to these kids and um, my, my kids spend more time at school than they do with me during the week and um, so I want them to have an opportunity to feel valued in this place where all the staff feels valued as well so um, I would just ask that they look at the bigger picture thank you guys so much for your time and for all the investments that you've made in your kids and in the public school system and thanks for letting your voices be with us today Hey, Leslie, thanks for sitting down and talking with us today. Thank you for having me. So, Leslie, what district do you teach in? Um, I teach in Oklahoma City Public Schools. Awesome. And what uh, what grade do you teach? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. That sounds like a fun age. Yes. And how long have you been, um, how long have you been a teacher? Um, I have been a teacher for about 12 years total. 12 years total. Have you always taught in Oklahoma City Public Schools or... Where else have you taught? Um, I've taught in uh, inner city Fort Worth, in Plano, Texas, and then Oklahoma City Public Schools. Has the majority of your time in education been in Texas or here in Oklahoma? Here in Oklahoma. Awesome. Well, we sure appreciate the job that you do. Um, I think you have a unique perspective having taught in multiple districts across multiple states. Kind of with that in mind, what do you think about the state of education in Oklahoma generally, but Oklahoma City even more specifically? Um, I do have to say, whenever I think about education, I really think back to my days in Texas and how I was never i I was never worried or I didn't really feel like unsafe like I do now um, in the way that I just. Um, I never know if I'm going to have what I need for my kids. Um, I am very fortunate to work in a school uh, that has high um, parent involvement, and so they give me a lot of what I need. But um, as far as um, even my my own child uh, that goes to attends Oklahoma City Public School, she's in middle school, and she and her friend have to share a textbook. Um, And so when they're doing homework, they have to FaceTime each other to be able to do their math homework so they can both see the textbook. So I would say um, where in Texas, there wasn't really a worry to have what we needed. Definitely here. It's it's more of it's more of a worry. So. Wow. Um, What do you see as kind of, you know, thinking about problems like kids sharing textbooks, not, you know, knowing what you're going to 
not knowing what you're going to need or not knowing if you're going to have what you need. What do you see are kind of the major obstacles to improving education in Oklahoma? What, what do you feel like are kind of the impediments or maybe even another way to put that is where do you kind of see the problems coming from? What's the, what's the root of the issue to you? One root cause that I think is um, teacher turnover. Um, And also there are a lot of emergency certifications. And so when you have a teacher going into a classroom, um, like say for instance, we did not have a reading curriculum for a year. Um, So I could, I've been teaching for a long time. Um, I feel like I've studied kindergarten and I know kindergarten pretty much in and out. So yes, so if I don't have curriculum, I can um, come up with lessons because I've taught the same lessons for a lot of years and I'm invested in that and I could um, could do that. But if someone is coming in that is emergency certified, that is never taught or they're a first year teacher, they can't, um, since they don't maybe know the standards uh, in such a way in and out or know how the kids uh, will be able to learn the standards and everything, it's it's hard for a new teacher to be able to be a new teacher and then also be able to write basically their own curriculum. Uh, this year we haven't had a math curriculum and uh, because of funding again. And so again, teachers are e- either having to use their own money to buy curriculums off things. Um, there are sites where teachers um, write curriculums. So we're either having to use our own money to buy curriculums for their students uh, or basically make up our own um, lessons, which, you know, those would not be um, research-based. I mean, we can, there's no no way that I can make every lesson research-based. And so um, there are going to be a lot of gaps that the kids are going to have because they aren't going to have everything they need uh, as far as every skill they need for that that year so is it is it accurate to kind of paraphrase that you see really the lack of funding is the major issue that's the reason for the lack of curriculum is because there's no money to buy it teacher turnover is that also lack of funding in terms of you know salaries emergency certification is because we can't hire teachers that have the appropriate kind of training and qualifications is that it's really all it's a money issue I feel like it's a money issue um, because that also extends to things like we have a counselor at our school. We have a counselor for a day and a half. Um, So we have many kids and, you know, the statistics in Oklahoma are very high for kids that have experienced trauma or currently in trauma. So if we have a counselor for a day and a half per week, our kids are basically lined up needing to talk you know, to her. Um, she runs small groups, she comes in and teaches lessons, and we still don't have her enough to be able to um, really help those kids uh, in the way that they need help. Um, same way with, we only have a nurse for a, a day and a half a week. We have um, our uh, psych- psychologist for just a day a week. And so we just don't have what we need to really help our kids. And that is a funding issue as well. Wow. So I'm sure you, you know, it's been in the news a lot this week, both here locally and nationally. And obviously you're a teacher, so you're probably in the know on these sorts of things. But um, the big talk has been that the possibility of a strike or a work stoppage for teachers of some sort. Um, How do you, what are your thoughts, feelings on that? How do you feel about the possibility of of a strike or a work stoppage? When I first heard the news and people talking about it, um, really it scared me because I'm not a one that likes to make waves or I'm not a huge activist or anything like that. But then whenever I sit and think about, um, even we have three, um, three sections of of kindergarten, um, in our school and, um, one of the teachers is has three kids and she is single and she roughly make, brings home about $1,600 a month and there's no way that she can make it. So she has two other jobs and she also works all summer. And so 
I just have to put my focus on her that I'm, you know, this, this is her because I'm lucky enough to have, um, my husband is uh, another breadwinner. So I'm, I'm lucky that I, we can make it each month, but, um, I just think of her and how she has to fight every day to, to make it with her salary. And then, uh, the teacher across the hall, she's single and young, she's 24 and she cannot, she can't move out of her parents' house um, because she doesn't make enough. She works at Lakeshore every weekend, all weekend, uh, just to save money so that sometimes she could, um, at some point she could save up enough money to get an apartment and be on her own like she's always dreamed of. So so you're, one of your fellow faculty members at your school is a full-time degreed teacher and can't move out on her own living with her parents. Wow. So all that to say, it sounds like you're in favor of the strike. You feel like this it's time. This is what needs to happen. Is that accurate? Yes. I feel like it's time. Um, and like I said, it makes me nervous because I'm not one to have big opinions or make waves, but uh, I do feel like I have to fight for my friends. I have to fight for, you know, a fair wage and it's not just about the fair wages. It's also about um, just the education funding for our kids, that my kids that I love so dearly, you know, teachers are with their kids um, longer than some of their parents are during the day. And we fall so in love. I just wish everyone could just understand how much we fall in love with those kids. And just to have what's best for those kids, it's, I just think the time is now. Well, um, if you, and maybe that's it, maybe that, maybe you just, maybe you just answered my last question. Um, what if anything would you say to our legislatures, to the senators and representatives that are at the Capitol every day who, you know, ultimately, um, you know, assuming a strike happens, the ball's going to be in their court, um, to either do something about this or, or not. What message would you have for them? What would you want to say to them if they were here with us now? I think I would just, um, I guess there was just so, I would like to say to them, if there was any way that they could come and just be in our shoes and just see what happens every day and how much um, teachers really do affect their students' lives and um, just really the miracles that happen every day in classrooms um, all over the city, all over the nation. Um, It's just, it's amazing to see just how much a kid grows and just that relationship that you have and how much they learn and how really their lives are shaped by what a, what a teacher can do. And I think if they, if teachers felt more support and if teachers weren't, didn't have to be so worried about getting the supplies or maybe their own personal lives about being able to make it, we could work together to, um, really just make it a win-win for everyone. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for your time. And thanks for, you know, all the time uh, and effort that you're already putting into uh, our kids and our future here in Oklahoma. Thank you so much. All right, guys, we're back. So uh, first off, I want to say thank you so much to Leslie Sliv. Leslie Scrivener from uh, Oklahoma, City, Oklahoma City Public Schools, as well as Ryan and Jen Marshall, uh, for their time sitting down with us and giving their thoughts. Yes, thank um, you. Thank you. Kind of on to the subject of a teacher's strike. First, before we kind of get into it, a little a bit hot of... button issue. Yeah. Right? We got some breaking news. We do. We have, we have, we have, we have a little, little bit of breaking news. So, um, the Speaker McCall... Um, had scheduled a press conference for 3.30 today. Right. Um, then he scheduled it for 4.30. He actually came out and started talking about the time that we started recording. Yeah, at the time of this recording, yeah. which is right now, like, 7 you know, or so. He literally came out and started talking as we were as we were as we were recording. So I have not, I have not reviewed the contents of his press conference in detail, except to say that he came out and basically un- unveiled what they're calling a 60 by six plan. This was Speaker McCall and Representative Rogers, who's been chair of the education committee, um, outlining some, uh, 
some thoughts that they have or a so-called plan on how to get a teacher pay raise passed um, and would raise teacher salaries uh, by a total of uh, $5,400 over six years for someone with no experience to uh, $17,675 for someone with 25 years of experience. So this is a, a plan that they announced that I've said over the next six years, here is how we want to uh, increase teacher salaries. This is not an across the board raise. This is a raise that would alter the salary schedule for Oklahoma teachers. And so the raise that you would get over the next six years is contingent on how many years you have been teaching. Um, the OEA, uh, and this was about 45 minutes ago, um, Oklahoma Education Association has come out with a statement in response to speaker's press conference. It's short, so I'm just going to I'm just going to read it just so take us away. Uh, this is from OEA uh, on Speaker McCall's announced deal on teacher pay and this is a quote. The deal announced today by Speaker Charles McCall and his leadership team is not a plan at all. In fact, it's worse than the plan that failed in the Senate last night and once again, it's nothing more than a political stunt that falls woefully short of the revenue needed to save our schools and keep teachers in Oklahoma classrooms. The group that stood with him today should know that our students deserve better, that our teachers deserve better, and that Oklahomans deserve better. This movement is bigger than any one group who cares more about playing politics than doing what's right by our teachers. In fact, it's these kind of political games that have created the anger and frustration that is driving this movement. That's interesting. Let's, let's talk real quick about what the manifestations of this movement could be, right? So we're talking about a planned teacher walkout, right? Planned for early April. Uh, last estimate that we read, 25,000 protesters, okay? And possible state employee stoppage of work to coincide with this walkout. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So I think it's important to note that one, this shows that, you know, despite some efforts by uh, leadership in the legislature, we are still, you know, at least as of, as of now, we are nowhere near averting a work, uh, averting uh, a a work stoppage. Number one. Um, Number two, um, I think it's important to note that, you know, one of the, one of the demands that teachers have that have put out here, I, I think that the teachers have been pretty clear in saying that this is consistently mm-hmm. that one, this is not just about their salaries. I mean, listening with, you know, to my talk with Leslie, this is not just about her salary or the salary of her colleagues. This is about the fact that they have to buy their own curriculum. This is about the fact that they have to share textbooks. This is about that. They, you know, listening to the marshals. This is about that kids don't, that, that kids don't have the resources in the classroom that because they need. Teachers may not have access to those resources. Is right. that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's exactly it. And this is not a plan. This sixty by six plan is not a plan that addressed that. Right. So it. I mean, I'm. You know, and this is this is getting a little bit into uh, what we try to avoid here. You know, like I guess like I don't know punditry, whatever you want to call it. But like, I think that this is maybe a, a bit of a misreading of the tea leaves here by the leadership. Like. Teachers are not just advocating for a raise for themselves. They want a raise for public employees. They want a raise for themselves. And they want better classroom support uh, in terms of resources. And this is not a plan that did anything to address that. So in terms of implications, I think that, I mean, unless we see something new, I think that in two weeks and four days, we are still, we are still on a a we're on track on, on track mean, you know to see a, a to see a work stoppage from teachers and public employees and the, the the other thing that's important to note is that again we didn't watch the press conference and i i you know we just haven't as well, we we're, were as we're trying we were doing this we're doing this right. you know i and we I'm can we'll, do a we'll, special update yeah and, and we'll we, and, and we we'll should. and we will as we will as needed but i'm seeing kind of scrolling here through the through the tweeter um <laughs> that that apparently they they didn't propose any real sort of funding mechanism. Like, like there's not a dedicated, you know, the estimates are the 60 by six plan is that this, this would cost over six years. It would cost like $700 million and there's no funding stream. So, so like, where is that? Like, where's that going to come from? And, and again, we, we have no indication as we sit here on this pod, whether this teacher walkout 
um, and plan possible state employee stoppage. Is that a day? Is that a couple of days? I mean, it could go on. I mean, it could. What are the potential ramifications of that as you see them, sir? Well, so I think, you know, there's there's a bunch and 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 I'm not trying to kind of I'm not trying to prioritize them here, but you know, In no particular order. I mean, you know, what, what I, jumps to mind. So the first thing that comes to mind is one child care, right? So there are Absolutely. a lot there are a lot of families in Oklahoma where mom and dad or mom and mom or dad and dad or whatever, both parents, whatever that situation is, or certainly single parent families where all the adults are at work, right? Mm-hmm. And child care is expensive. Expensive. Mm-hmm. I don't even have kids, and I can tell you that prim- that uh, that childcare is expensive. I so think you, you and I you both know, worked in fields where we saw firsthand what the cost of yeah, childcare, so, what that burden is, what that barrier is. Yeah. So 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 that's that's first off is like if you're a single parent or both parents work and you've got kids that are in you know kindergarten and third grade and your teacher's not there, what are you what are you going to do with kids all day? Number one. Um, second, as we've alluded to with the lunch shaming bill. Um, a huge number of children in Oklahoma depend on the school system for food. For food. Okay? That's like, right. That's like all there are, there are mm-hmm. a bunch of children. I mean, hundreds of thousands of children in Oklahoma where their main meals, Monday through Friday, are the breakfast and lunch that they get served while they're at school. And so, so a very real concern is even if there's child care available, what are these kids going to eat? When they're not at school, so that's You're talking about sixty six percent of yeah. the meals that they're going to have for the week. Yeah, so so that's 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 kind of one and two. Next next on the list of things that come to my mind are you know you've got high schoolers that are trying to prepare for AP tests, for the ACT, for the SAT. You know, uh, Ryan Engine Marshall alluded to international baccalaureate tests. Um, it's not that they. It's not that that students won't still be able to take those tests because they can. Those tests are, for the most part, all administered by outside entities, not the public school system, so they can still take the tests. But, I mean, you know, if you've ever tried to take, like, the AP history test or, you know, BC calculus test, the last two, three weeks before AP test time, I mean, that's crunch time, right? Like, that's a big deal. Yeah, There's a lot of teachers. To take it hungry, tired, yeah. any of those things. And, and a lot of teachers offer review courses. There's ACT, SAT prep courses that are offered through the school system. Um, so, you know, and this, this, I think, has potentially real implications there as well. Now, when you talk about broader kind of policy implications, um, Oklahoma, like most states, we get a lot of money from the federal government for education, if we don't meet a certain number of instructional hours, if we don't meet a mandatory minimum number of instructional hours, um, then we start losing money. We lose matching funds from the feds. Uh, and I don't, th- I think, I think everyone would agree that we <laughs> are not in a situation where we can afford to lose money. Additionally, if, um, certainly not in a position to leave it on the table. That's yeah, what you're saying. Yeah. And then there's also, um, the state testing. If you miss these testing days, that can jeopardize federal funding as well. So, and those testing days are scheduled for the end of April, you know, so the teachers or at least some of the teachers organizations are saying they're prepared for a 10 day walkout starting April 2nd, 10 days, 10 business days, call that 14 That's April 16th. The implications of this, I think would be hard to, to overstate. And, you know, I'm just kind of scrolling through my Twitter feed here and, you know, representative, you know, I see representative Rogers, um, has said, uh, and this is who did this the press conference, Speaker McCall, who's the former chair of the Education Committee, Representative Rogers has come out and in the press conference said that they came up with this plan without talking to OEA, which is the main teachers union. I'm seeing one. I'm seeing a Republican and, senator, and also the organizer, yeah, and, of, of the of the of walkout. The walkout. There is a Republican state senator who is on Twitter saying, and I quote. Can someone tell me how we're going to pay for this? Acknowledging that there's no revenue stream for this. So right. this, we're this, seeing that now. Yeah. This this press conference, I think, really just um, reiterates how how far apart how far apart we are. And I'll tell you, you know, I asked, I've I've asked some legislators, like, assuming a teacher walkout personally. happens, yeah, personally, like, the, assuming a teacher walkout happens. Is this going? Is this going to move the legislature? And the response that I have gotten overwhelmingly is, absolutely, it will. The only question is how long it takes. Um, which 
which on the one hand, if you're the teachers, sounds encouraging. But on the other hand, um, every day that this goes on has real consequences. So here, here's another question I'd like to ask you, Scott. What could be accomplished between now and the organized scheduled date of the walkout that could rectify this, that could stop the disruption to uh, – our state, but also to those that are seeking those services, including uh, the children that are enrolled in those schools. What, 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 what could happen now that you think would satisfy those parties that are considering this walkout? So I think that's really, there's, there's really kind of two questions within a question there. So the, you know, I think what you're asking is, I think what you're asking is what's possible. Um, but what's possible to, to, kind of solve this impasse and then what's available are really two separate questions. That's intriguing. Expand on that. Right. So I, and what I mean by what's available is are there funding streams that the legislature could tap to fund every single demand that the teachers are making? And the answer is unequivocally. Yes. Oklahoma policy came out with a great graphic earlier today. And so for fiscal year 2009, that that kind of deals with this for fiscal year 2019, the total funding proposal, everything, if you gave the teachers everything they're asking for in FY 2019, Uh that would cost $812 million. Okay. Okay. So now let's say just for instance, that that capital gains exemption that passed the Senate, we've already talked about, Uh let's say that passes the house and the governor signs it. That's 120. Okay. Let's say that you restore the gross production tax, not to 7%, which is what a lot of the super, like a lot of the progressives really want is 7%. Okay. Let's say you take it to five and 5% has been the democratic caucus, particularly in the house. 5% GPT has been their kind of line in the sand. We're not, we're not signing on to any revenue proposal so, that so, doesn't so do a that. number that has been debated before. Right. Okay. Right. So let's say you do 5% GPT. That's 200 million. Okay. Let's say that you reverse the income tax cuts. Okay, so you can reverse income tax cuts. That's three hundred million. Let's okay. say that you pass the dollar fifty per pack cigarette tax. That's two hundred and fifty million. Let's say you do the six cent a gallon motor vehicle tax. Okay, that's one hundred and seventy million. Well, what's I mean, that come out to? We're, we're, For those keeping score, at home. we're we're almost talking real money. I mean, that all of those things together is is right at a billion dollars. Um, okay policy has a couple other proposals on here that I'm not even, that I'm not even going to get into because those aren't things that have been really debated in terms of okay. revenue packages. The main things that we've been talking about are motor fuels, cigarette tax, capital gains deduction. The Dems have wanted income taxes. Those never, never been on the table. And then gross production tax. Where do you set it? But Certainly if, things that have come to the floor and right. have been debated, right. very tangible. So if you set GPT at five, you reverse the income tax cuts, you end the capital gains uh, exemption, which happened earlier in the Senate today, you raise the cigarette tax by $1.50, and you raise the motor vehicle tax by six cents a gallon. That's a billion dollars. Okay. okay. So that's a billion dollars, one billion minus 812 million, right? So you'd, you'd fund everything the teachers are asking for. You'd have a, a bit of a surplus. You'd, you'd fund everything they're asking for, and you'd have $180, $188 million left to play with. And, you know? and, and, and the majority of that, if not all of it, is recurring revenue. Which is a crucial point. Which is a crucial point, right? So that we're not talking about a one-time, rainy-day fund type of situation here. We're right. talking about recurring revenue. Right. The kicker is that every single thing I just mentioned with the exception of ending the capital gains exemption, requires 75% in both chambers. That means and 76 That means seventy six votes in the House and 36 votes in the Senate. Right. Certainly issues that we'll keep an eye on. Thank you, Scott, for that very good analysis. Hey, man. And uh, you know what? I, I appreciate you joining us this week. This has oh, been... Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I'm a friend of the pod. We've, uh, we've, we've talked about some stuff. We've... Uh, We've had some scotch. We've checked the Twitter. We've talked policy. So, uh, Jip, parting parting thoughts? Parting thoughts are, w- there are significant pieces of legislation that we talked about today that we're going to keep an eye on. Okay, And there are significant pieces of community action that w- we can't ignore. I mean, we're going to have to see how this teacher's 
um, walk out along with, if it comes to fruition, state agency stoppage of work. What does that mean? How does that play out? And how does that impact the people of Oklahoma? So we got a lot to keep an eye on. And I look forward to listening to the pod in the future uh, for an update on that. You know, and I'm I am really, really glad that you mentioned what the you know, that community community action, people getting engaged. That's what's what we're all about here. At Let's fix this. Important to remember that two weeks in two weeks is going to be coming events. It's going to be our next capital day right before the teacher, the plan, as as we know it right, now, right. the plan teachers the walkout. Week before the teacher walkout, uh, that'll be our next capital day. Uh, we will be in the blue room for meet and greet and orientation, and then instructions for kind of what you can do. If you don't next. know where it is, make sure that you ask a friendly person there at the uh, capital. They'll direct you right to it. That'll wrap us up for this week, and we will see you guys here back next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. That brings us to the end of this episode. Remember. You can connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at Let's Fix This OK. Scott is at SC Melson and Andy is at Andy OKC. You can also like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Let's Fix This OK. Our website is Let's Fix This OK.org and there you can sign up for our newsletter, read our blog, find resources, and then details about upcoming events. Our podcast is edited and produced by Scott Melson and Andy Moore, and Let's Pod This is a member of the Mostly Harmless Media Network. Our theme music is provided by the Sugar Free All Stars. Let's Fix This is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization who strives to educate and equip all Oklahomans to engage with their government. We encourage you to get involved in any way you can. Remember, decisions are made by those who show up.